Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the technical session three on computing of the International Research Conference 2023 of General Sir John Kutalavala Defence University. This technical session is based on the theme of innovative applications of AI and machine learning in education, healthcare, and industry, and will be chaired by Dr. S. R. Lienage. Ladies and gentlemen, I would cordially invite Mrs. M. K. P. Madhushanka to give you a brief introduction on Dr. S. R. Lienage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you all to the technical session three. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed chairperson, Dr. S. R. Lienage. Dr. Lienage graduated from University of California with Bachelor of Science Honors in Statistics and Computer Science in 2005. He completed Master of Philosophy in Computer Engineering from University of Peradeniya in 2009 and received PhD from the National University of Singapore in 2013. His research interests are in brain-computer interfaces, data science and applications of machine learning and pattern recognition. He is the head of the department and a senior lecturer attached to the Department of Software Engineering, Faculty of Computing and Technology, University of Kalania. He has published several research papers in reputed journals with more than 200 citations and has a Google Edge Index of 6. I cordially invite Dr. S. R. Lienage to chair the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Now, I cordially invite the rapporteur and the speakers of the session to be seated in the appropriate seat allocated for you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, we will uh, start this session uh, first with the, first uh, we'll have the online uh, presentations. So, starting with uh, ID number 261, uh, RDAV Tenacon, LP Kalansuria and GAI Vantika. The title of the paper is uh, Deep Learning Based Approach for Obstructive Sleep Apnea Detection Using EEG Signals. And thank you for joining us today at the International Research Conference. Today I will be presenting my research paper on the use of deep learning for detection of obstructive sleep apnea. My presentation will cover the various approaches, techniques and architectures that have been proposed for the use of deep learning in the detection of obstructive sleep apnea. I am excited to share this information with you today and welcome any questions you may have after the presentation. My co-authors are Dr. Pradeep Kalansuria and Ms. Isuri Uvandiga. Under these topics, I am going to explain my paper. First of all, I will talk about what is sleep apnea and the background. Second, we will look at what problem does it address and the name, literature and methodology we used. And finally, let me tell you what the results are. Now, let's move on to our introduction part. Quality sleep is crucial to maintaining physical and psychological well-being throughout the life cycle. It has a significant impact on brain functions as well as human body renewal and restoration. Humans spend around one third of their everyday lives sleeping. Sleep is necessary but nearly 40% of Americans suffer from sleep problems such as insufficient sleep time, respiratory problems such as obstructive sleep apnea, neurological disorders related to sleep, difficulty for in or staying sleep. When a person is sleeping, their breathing can become disrupted, known as sleep apnea. If left unrated, the significant sleep condition can cause major health issues including high blood pressure and heart difficulties. There are three different forms of sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is the first form resulting from a physical upper airway blockage. The majority of cases of this kind of sleep apnea are seen in overweight men over 35 who have big tonsils, a small jaw and a narrow airway opening. Approximately 
84% of those with sleep apnea have obstructive sleep apnea. Secondly, sleep apnea is caused by an inability to breathe known as central sleep apnea. The chest and diaphragm muscles which regulate respiration do not receive signals from the brain for a limited period while this condition is present. Around 0.4% of those with sleep apnea have central sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can also occur as mixed sleep apnea resulting from alternating extended stretches of OSC and short bursts of central sleep apnea. Mixed sleep apnea is thought to affect 15% of all sleep apnea sufferers. The most popular sleep study or test for identifying sleep apnea is polysomnography. Various psychological signals are simultaneously recorded during sleep as part of polysomnography. ECG, eye tracking, EEG, jaw muscle tone, chest and stomach activity, oxygen stimulation, and anchor movements are example of these signals. Apnea is a disorder that affects middle-aged adults and can cause various symptoms including excessive sleepiness, depression and increased accident risk. The patient's sleep is tracked during polysomnography and the results are then assessed by a sleep expert. The diagnosis can only be made offline after the signals have been collected overnight. It is also oppressive and highly costly. Therefore, it follows that the development of less intrusive and more portable technologies is crucial. However, over the past several decades, many alternatives have been proposed to replace conventional methods due to their complexity and time commitment. But these methods have not been implemented as a system yet. The study aims to determine the best approach for deep learning based system for the detection of obstructive sleep apnea and to analyze existing approaches that have not been implemented as of today. Let's move on to the literature review part. Science Direct, Icicle Explorer. PubMed ResearchGit and other specialized databases were employed for literature search. Keyword, keywords associated with our study are discovered as a first step. When employing logical operators with a keyword combination, the search process was more productive. 918 total research papers are founded in all databases. Then AEG and ACG based research are chosen among these papers and similar documents and the same ones are removed. After then highly cited and most recent research papers are identified. Multiple classifiers, signal preprocessing techniques and feature extraction techniques have been suggested to detect OSC according to the user signal. However, these six methods have yet to be developed on a system. This section will use the most recent and highly cited papers that have proposed algorithms based on ECG and AEG signals. The study of sleep EEG synchronization has recently emerged as a frontier for understanding brain functions. Newer sleep studies have demonstrated that sleep issues may be identified and predicted using just one EEG channel. Therefore, the advance, advancement of automated approaches result in the evaluation of sleep quality. A method used in the identification process is the analysis of EEG data. Another common factor frequently employed in the diagnosis of sleep apnea is the ECG. Rather than EEG, there are more sleep studies research using ECG signals. While researchers studied the best technique for automatically detecting sleep apnea occurrences from an electrocardiogram signal. This, this study illustrates deep learning methodologies for the automatic detection of sleep apnea events. Six learning, six deep learning techniques were used. The best performing model had 99% accuracy rate and the GRU and 1D Conventional neural network model also had 99% record rates. 
using the electroencephalogram crime or another researcher proposed an effective approach that could be applied in hardware to distinguish OSC patients from healthy controls. According to the research observations, the support vector machine outperformed the competition with an accuracy rate of 97%. This overview diagram shows the methodology. A hybrid classifier strategy is used for deep learning based obstructive sleep apnea detection system in order to precisely uh, detect sleep apnea using EEG signals. To do this, the suggested methodology mainly use conventional neural network and artificial neural networks. Let's discuss each step one by one. Data gathering is the initial step of the approach. Patients with obstructive sleep apnea undergo electroencephalogram which record EEG signals. The deep learning based classifier models are trained and evaluated using this data as the basis. This, these databases are used for this. To get rid of noise and artifacts, the recorded EEG signals are pre-processed. The quality of the EEG data is improved and uh, pertinent data is extracted for identification of sleep apnea using pre-processing techniques such as filtering, normalization and feature extraction. Then the deep learning model is built utilizing the algorithms of CNN and ANN to automatically extract distinguishing features from pre-processed EEG signals. The CNN architecture is used. It makes use of the spatial information contained in the EEG data to capture regional sleep apnea patterns. The hybrid classifiers ANN component is in charge of extracting temporal dependencies and higher level representations from EEG signals. Finally, depending on the learned features, sleep apnea cases are classified using logistic regression and decision making layer. A labeled dataset that comprises EEG data tag with sleep apnea information is used to train the hybrid classifier model. Back propagation and gradient descent optimization techniques are used to train the model on the data set which is split into training and validation sets. The performance of the model is optimized through hyperparameter adjustment. A different test data sets is utilized to create how will the suggested solution performs. In order to evaluate the system performance in identifying sleep apnea, the trained hybrid classifier is applied to this data set and performance measures like accuracy, sensitivity, specificity and area under the curve are computed. The effectiveness of the proposed deep learning based classifier is compared with current state of the art techniques for sleep apnea identification in order to validate the findings. The accuracy and effectiveness of the hybrid classifier technique are established through this comparison. The recommended approach makes sure that the deep learning based obstructive sleep apnea detection system makes the most of the capabilities of CNN, ANN and logistic regression algorithms to precisely identify sleep apnea patterns in AEG signals. In order to better detect sleep apnea and ultimate assist in the diagnosis and treatment of those who suffer from sleep apnea, sleep disease, the hybrid classifier approach was developed. This study emphasized the potential benefits and limitations of an EEG based hybrid classifier system which includes CNN, ANN and logistic regression techniques. The main focus of this research is on improving precision and efficiency in detecting obstructive sleep apnea for timely diagnosis and treatment. Performance performance measures including accuracy, sensitivity, specificity were used to access the system's ability to identify sleep apnea accurately. Okay, the time is up. So, uh, we are going to take all the Q&A at the end of this session. So, let's uh, move on to the uh, next online presentation now. Um, 
and you and then we can order now on behalf of our authors and we present our research study title a gated recurrent unit neural network based predictive maintenance approach for machinery maintenance in the apparel industry today we will be looking at the objective of our study then the literature we have done related to this research work then we will be looking at the methodology that was being carried out with the results that were being obtained We all know that the Sri Lankan garment industry has been garnering a lot of attention by bringing the country huge income over the past few years. But just like any other industry, this garment industry of Sri Lanka also has faced with problems, and we have focused on providing solutions concerning machinery maintenance. So let me take an example for you. So it is a must for the machinery to perform really well when good products are produced. However, There are sometimes machines that work at a very high speed. I'm just taking an example. So there are machines that work at a high speed. Like for one second, such machines can press around four buttons on a garment. So imagine this operation breaks down for a couple of minutes. Couple of minutes, a very small time as it seems. But no, such kind of a breakdown can cause a huge loss of income for the whole factory. And this is why. It is a must for machinery equipment to work regularly without giving the mechanical crew problems. And our research work has therefore presented the predictive maintenance based methodology with fusing a typing type of a deep learning model called gated recurrent neural network to predict the machinery breakdown due to component failures. Of course. Like I mentioned, the term predictive maintenance we have used it here because it has the ability to predict future outcomes by observing the historical records. But there are also other methods such as this run towards failure and preventive maintenance. Both are very costly considered predictive maintenance because in run towards failure we fix a problem only once it occurs. So sometimes it can lead us to a huge cost because of the unplanned downtime. And preventive maintenance is better than run towards failure, but Sometimes we create plan schedules that won't be necessary. So once again, it might cause a scores. And as you can see here as well, with predictive maintenance, we can monitor equipment in real time, and as well as we can perform advanced predictions using data analysis, which is why we use predictive maintenance in our work as well. So which brings us to the objective of our study. Our aim was to explore how various deep learning models, such as basic deep learning models, and as well as, as models based on recurrent neural networks, such as simple recurrent neural networks, gated recurrent neural networks, which are also called as GRUs, and long short-term memory networks (LSTNs) can be used to predict machinery component malfunctioning. So, considering past works that has been done related to this area. The authors Guduru and others they have discussed the usage of preventive maintenance with genetic algorithms, giving a very good solution. However, the other authors of this paper, Sulston and others, they have contained a detailed description of why predictive maintenance is preferred over preventive maintenance, which is why we also use the same methodology. And A. Wahid, J. G. Beslin, M. A. Indizar, they have used a hybrid model which uses C. N. N. and L. S. T. M. model to perform predictions. in a similar manner so this is an overview of the methodology we carried out we will be discussing this in the upcoming slides so to begin with the methodology we use this data set found in this repository which contained details of hundreds of similar machines so it also contained machinery details as well as maintenance records and non breaking errors thrown by these machines and as well as sensory data recorded per every hour such as voltage vibration pressure and rotation and finally the most important factor machinery component failures so this is a brief overview of our data and first we use the maintenance data set to get the machinery component replacement frequencies and then we use the sensory data also known as telemetry data with the time stamps where we use lag features and using lag features we were able to obtain roll in mean and roll in standard deviation which were calculated for voltage pressure vibration rotation readings considering every 6 hours and 24 hours to capture a long term effect so these time windows can change accordingly according to the business case and it should be noted as well So then, in a similar method to calculate lag features of telemetry data, we then used uh, the errors data set to get the frequency of errors that were being thrown, considering the lag features, since this database also consists of timestamps. And finally, we integrated the failures related data and machinery data to get the final data model. Then, other 
uh, traditional transformation such as um, removing null values, converting category variables into uh, numerical va uh, variables was also done. And finally, the component failure was prepared as a target column because we are here to predict machinery component failures, which had four different types of components, which made it as a multi-class classification problem. However, we also found out that there's a class imbalance in this target column, so we had to use SMART method, synthetic minority oversampling technique, to handle the data imbalance problem. So these are the five different deep learning models we use to train this problem. Uh, normal deep learning model and then rest of the four models were trained with SMART because we had to consider data imbalance and the other three models, RN and GRU and LSTM, all these three models have the ability to uh, process sequential data and we know that LSTMs are complex and takes very time, RNNs are simple, GRUs are intermediate and this is a comparison between these three models. So these are the model architectures, this is for the basic model that was used. And of course, for the GRU, RNN, and LSTM model, we use this architecture. We replace the first layer according to the model. I'm sorry, this is the slide which contains the metrics used to measure model performances. And these are the model accuracies that were being obtained. As you can see, the GRU SMART model has obtained the highest accuracy, while the RNN SMART model has obtained the lowest accuracy. However, all the accuracies are over 97%, which means the models seem to be performing really well, but do they? This is when the loss learning curves come into the picture because we need to know whether the model is overfitting or not for it to perform really well. So overfitting happens when the model seems to be performing really well, however it cannot generalize on the unseen data. And if the model is really good, then the loss learning curve should be showing a less overfitting fact. For example, the first graph is showing very less overfitting because the gap between the training loss and the validation loss is very low. However, can you see in the second graph for the model train with small mechanism on the basic neural network, the gap is very high, which means there is an overfitting aspect. However, GRU SMART and RNN SMART, both models have performed really well. They have very low amount of overfitting. And finally, the LSTM SMART model once again has obtained a little amount of overfitting because there is a minimum gap between the loss learning curve of training loss and validation loss. And therefore, we had to remove this LSTM SMART model and as well as the um, basic neural network based SMART model. And we had to also remove this uh, basic neural networks model because this model does not have the ability to handle class imbalance. Therefore, our best models were the GRU SMART model and the RNN SMART model. We were also able to obtain the precision we call F1 scores as well. And as you can see, both RNN SMART and GRU SMART models have performed really well. Their scores are very optimal. But as you can remember, the highest accuracy was obtained in the GRU SMART model. Both have performed very closely. And therefore, we chose GRU SMART model as the best model since it had the best optimal values and as well as it had the ability to handle data and balance and there was no overfitting present in the model. So we used this model to perform the predictions. Therefore, in conclusion, our research work has explored the fusion of predictive maintenance by testing with traditional deep learning models and recurrent neural network based deep mo learning models to address machine maintenance challenges. So using multi-class classification models, we specifically use gated recurrent neural networks with SMART to perform predictions. And of course, other techniques such as handling data imbalance using cost-sensitive learning or different oversampling methods can be done. And also this technology-based uh, 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 feature engineering techniques can be also used to test and even to increase accuracy. So these are some of the references that we referred while performing this study. And thank you very much for being here with me today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Navaratna, for your nice presentation. So please stick around uh, towards the end of our session. Uh, we will have the Q&A session. So you will have some questions to answer. Uh, next, uh, we will move on to our first uh, physical presentation. 
is going to be done by W.A.M. Vanyarachi and H.K.'s Premadasa. The title of the research is Integrated Model for Identifying the Learning Style of the Students Using Machine Learning Techniques and Approach of Felder Silverman Learning Style Model. Okay, uh, good afternoon all. Uh, so my research uh, is about and uh, proposing an integrated model for identifying the learning style of the students based on the uh, Felder Silverman Learning Style Model. So this is the by flow of presentation. People learn it many ways uh, throughout their lifetime. If we get the systematic education process, there are, we can identify two uh, components as teacher and the students. Teachers are delivering course content and where the learners are grabbing the course. But in this course delivering process, the one size fits all method will always not work. Because if we consider individual, each person, they have their own way of learning. So, the identification of this learning style of the students plays a vital role to improve the education process. So this is my research objective. Uh, the, my main objective is to explore the possible ways of applying the machine learning techniques for identify the uh, learning style uh, of the students and performers. To uh, achieve that, I uh, happen to uh, define several specific objectives that identify the features of the FLSM model, FLSM learning style model that can be uh, integrated with the uh, learning style identification, and uh, to find a method for tracking students' activities and behavior in the online learning environment, and uh, to check the apply of machine learning techniques for them. The significance of my studies, yes, it's true that the uh, uh, number of research are going on in the uh, field. Uh, most of them are depend on the Moodle logs only. How we access the Moodle logs? The, most of the researchers have decided this uh, learning style identification based on their Moodle logs. But in uh, my proposed methodology, I have combined two factors as the access time and the access hit for the Moodle logs as well as the total time a student spends on the uh, online learning environment. For this, I use the uh, Moodle as a platform as I need a platform to uh, test this. This is the, my overall uh, research methodology. First, I went to a systematic literature review to identify the uh, uh, learning style uh, model, what is a fellow Silverman and what are the attributes I can uh, apply for this. And uh, I happen to design some plugins, especially two plugins for the Moodle environment for data collection process. And I went through the experimental design, and I then combined these frequency of access in the Moodle logs, as well as the total time a student spend on each activity. And then I went through the machine learning data pre-processing process, a model development and model evaluation, and the hyperparameter tuning, and then the model deployment. So if we consider the FLSM model, it has main uh, four dimensions as processing, input, perception, and understand. For this, uh, I have decided to randomly selected seven features. Randomly selected seven features as uh, use of the forum post, exercises, use of the videos, charts, images, and graphs, and notes, concrete content, abstract content, as well as course outline their uh, learning process. Once I selected these all features, uh, these are one of the significance of my research as well. I went through a validation process to identify the correlation of these each feature. Uh, for this, I uh, use Pearson correlation uh, coefficient analysis. Uh, this heat map shows how the correlation has been varied with the each of the feature. So uh, it has four main dimensions as I discussed. It's input, processing, perception, and understanding. For each of these dimensions, I check the uh, correlation between the uh, attributes. Uh, then uh, for the data labeling process first, I happen to use uh, uh, already accepted questionnaire. That is, uh, we call index learning style questionnaire. That is already accepted method and uh, uh, proposed by the uh, fellow Silleman. First, I used uh, those uh, questionnaire and I selected uh, whatever the responses of the students. I uh, first decide in a manual way about their learning style. 
So this is the uh, time tracking plugin, plugin I developed for the uh, Moodle environment. This is a reusable plugin. Any of the uh, Moodle platform, uh, we can use this plugin. Uh, so here, as in the uh, left side, you can see all the activities I have. Actually, the course content I have decided for a particular course content, covering all these attributes. At least I have decided five types of course contents. So once the student uh, completed the course using this plugin in the uh, Moodle environment, we can uh, select whatever the activity and uh, their total time in seconds they are uh, spent in each activity. So this is my uh, actually the experimental uh, design for the preparation of the data set and uh, data pre-processing stage and data modeling and the uh, final model evaluation. For the data sets, I selected three courses uh, going on the uh, university as uh, DBMS, data structures, and the program frameworks. Out of these three, I used two courses for the uh, model uh, development process for the training, and I kept one course aside for the uh, consistency checking process. Actually, I used uh, DBMS course and the data structures for the uh, model uh, development or model training and I use another other course for the uh, check the model consistency. For the each of course contains nearly 150 student data sample. So uh, this is how I created the data labeling. These are the feature variables. First uh, you can see the forum post, exercises. These are the dimensions I use for the course design process. And uh, for the each dimension it has, act, uh, if you consider the uh, Input it has active, reflective, likewise for dimensions. For the each, I have sub-dimensions, active, uh, moderate, and the mild. So once the data was collected, uh, then I went for the data modeling process. I uh, use five uh, supervised machine learning classifiers as decision tree, logistic regression, random forest, support vector, and k-nearest neighbor algorithm. So these are the uh, results of my uh, research. For the each dimension, I happen to train the model because the labels are different for the each dimension, same data set and the each dimension. So uh, here there is a comparison for the two courses uh, as databases and the data structures and algorithm. As you can see, uh, the decision tree here has given higher accuracy. And uh, is the comparison as uh, when you see the comparison chart, it uh, displays that uh, Average, it uh, give around uh, 93 of for this input dimension. Same as the, uh, for the perception, processing and dimension as well, I uh, con conducted the uh, same method. As average uh, perception dimension, uh, dimension, it has given nearly uh, 83, as you can see in the uh, diagram, and the processing dimension, it will be nearly uh, 91 percentage. Uh, and the understanding dimension nearly uh, 92 like. So uh, both of, uh, for this all four dimensions, it has the decision tree algorithm has performed with uh, nearly a higher accuracy. Then once I selected the uh, accuracy, it will be not enough to, uh, to check whether this model is good. Then I went for the model evaluation process as well. And there I uh, went for the k fault cross-validation. The purpose of this K-fold cross-validation is uh, it says how this model will uh, behave in actually a new environment. If we uh, test for this uh, new environment, how this uh, model will be uh, react. Then uh, it shows that the accuracy around 96 percentage and the standard deviation around 10. That means uh, how the data points will be around the mean. If we uh, get a higher value, it will be not uh, as a good model. And I also consider the medians, mean squared uh, bias and the uh, various for the uh, identify the, uh, the underfitting and the overfitting data. It's also given uh, low values. That means the model is not uh, meet with the uh, underfitting and overfitting context. Once I selected the best model, as I said, the decision tree classifier always give the uh, best result for this. Then I went for the hyperparameter tuning. I, for that, I use the grid search methodology. In this grid search methodology, uh, once the code is written, it will give uh, given a combination of parameters. 
I uh, refer to this CycleLearn uh, library. It will give a combination of parameters like uh, Gini entropy, uh, base random, and the max step. Then uh, always it gave the uh, Gini. Uh, if we consider two parameters, Gini and entropy, uh, the Gini parameters always give the higher. Uh, it's give a uh, low time with the uh, performing the model. So this is the consistency of model. For the consistency of model, I again use the ILS questionnaire and get the answers and uh, I check again with the uh, responses uh, acquired through my model. Average, as you can see, for the all dimensions, input, perception, processing and understanding, uh, it show average consistency of good value uh, nearly 90, 92 and 93. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, this uh, research can be summarized as uh, I went through a uh, attribute validation process whether although uh, other research are not uh, much concerned about that, uh, I could identify there is a close relationship between this frequency of access and the uh, time spent uh, around the uh, in the modal platform. And the decision tree classification algorithm performs well with the highest accuracy, always with the four dimensions of it and the uh, hyperparameter tuning, the genie and the genie and the best as the function give a higher value. So if I consider my research, these are the contribution of my research to the research community. I have uh, actually there were no data sets, predefined data sets for the conducting research. Then I happened to uh, went through the data collection and create a data set. Then I uh, created the validated features of data set uh, using the FSLSM model, a real world data set. And I have uh, contributed the train and evaluated four machine learning model for the each dimension of the failure syllabus. And a reusable time tracking for the uh, model environment, which can be uh, reusable in any time for any researcher. So as I acknowledge, uh, I would like to thank my uh, supervisor, Dr. H.K. Premadasa as well as Dr. Pasan Maduranga for uh, his technical guidance. Oh, these are my some of the references. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vandiya Rachi, for your nice presentation. So if you have any questions, make note. Uh, we will take them all at the end of the session. So let's uh, move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, which is titled uh, Interactive Spelling Application for Preschoolers, A Journey Towards Playful Language Exploration. The authors are SHID and D. Silva, MTA Vikram Singha, and D. Gunasekara. The presenting author is uh, SHID and D. Silva, who is a fourth year information technology undergraduate of Faculty of Computing, General Sir John Kotlawal Defense University. His uh, areas of interest are human computer interaction, mobile development, and augmented reality. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to stand up here today to present my uh, research on interactive spelling application for preschoolers, a journey towards playful language exploration. So, here are my uh, co authors. I'm T.A. Vikramasinghe, is my co author, and my dear supervisor, Dino Kunasekara. So, these are the contents that I am going to present today. So the development of technology has uh, significantly uh, altered the way we learn, live, and also the work. So recently, uh, there has been a rise in interest in using technology to uh, improve education in preschoolers. And uh, uh, while uh, teaching spellings to uh, the kids using uh, traditional methods, uh, such as uh, dictation, uh, flashcards, uh, picture books, and textbooks, uh, teachers and parents uh, encounter several issues uh, and difficulties. So when uh, children experience uh, lack of uh, interest in learning, it can become challenging for them to retain the information they are taught. Uh, additionally, uh, teachers and parents might find themselves with uh, limited time to dedicate to uh, teaching spelling skills and children facing challenges in uh, remembering the letters of words uh, which may result in a lack of enthusiasm for learning. So the main problem that we found out is lack of interactivity uh, in current methods for teaching letter pronunciation and memorization 
of letters of preschool kids. Uh, when, uh, okay, so the objectives of our research are determine any difficulties uh, or uh, restrictions associated with the language learning in early childhood education and then develop a mobile application using augmented reality uh, to enhance spelling skills and finally aims to compare the effectiveness of this application and uh, in terms of increasing children's spelling skills. So the overall scope of this research uh, is to address the problem by giving an effective uh, solution for enhancing spelling skills and uh, language learning in kids. And the study specifically uh, explores the application's potential uh, to improve kids' ability in recognizing and memorizing particular letters inside the words. So limitations of the research are this study focuses on the uh, development of AR uh, applications for three to seven year old children. And as this is uh, still in the research stage, uh, this application has been developed only for Android operating system. So we have connected with Sri Lankan parents and preschool teachers to identify the uh, traditional methods that they are using to improve kids' language literacy. Uh, from that, we have identified the preferences of preschool kids uh, and the challenges faced by the teachers and the preschoolers. So as mentioned before, the identified problem was lack of interactivity. So through a comprehensive uh, investigation of previous research in this uh, field, we have identified that uh, limitations concerning the accuracy, interactivity, uh, and learning progress in current uh, language learning applications. So the level of interactivity provided by the applications may not be sufficient uh, to fully engage and stimulate young uh, learners. Uh, some applications uh, lack effective uh, tracking and evaluation uh, to assess the learning progress of preschool children. Uh, so it makes it difficult to parents and edu uh, educators to gauge the uh, outcome of their uh, kids. So through interviews and uh, questionnaires, uh, it shows that many children are not engaged and happy when participating in traditional activities uh, used to teach letters. So there's a concern about children quickly uh, losing interest and uh, becoming bored, uh, highlight highlighting the need of this kind of uh, application. So. When developing an app uh, to teach children to recognize and uh, remember specific letters within a word, it is important to uh, include a combination of effective, uh, uh, effective features such as uh, flashcards, visual cues, songs, repetition, and also letter sound associations. So uh, then by considering all the findings, uh, we have concluded that the prevalence of mobile phone usage uh, among children has significantly increased. Uh, in recent times and as a result it can be uh, concluded that the interactive mobile application uh, have the potential to uh, uh, effectively engage children in language learning activities. So we recommend utilizing app technology to en enhance the interactivity and uh, engage children in language literacy apps. So the development of AR application requires essential tools like the Android SDK, then the Cinform SDK, uh, which enables the dynamic AR uh, app, uh, creation without the OpenGL knowledge. Uh, the application SceneGraph connects virtual objects using the uh, transferable nodes and uh, physically based rendering ensures the realistic representation of the uh, with the accurate lighting. And uh, AR Core enables the Android devices to access the AR features using object tracking, light estimation, and environmental awareness without extra sensors. So the proposed uh, solution application has been designed with a well-defined uh, system architecture, which is depicted in this diagram. So this AR application uh, shows that uh, these virtual 3D representations of the uh, first letter and double letters of a given word. So it overlays them on the real world image captured by the camera when pointed at a surface. So let's go to a demonstration first. So you can see the there are a lot of animals we have added. And firstly, we have to scan the environment and tap on a node. Then the 3D object will appear on the uh, floor. And those uh, ballooned letters will appear in the display. So the kid can uh, touch them uh, in that correct order. So if the order is wrong, then they'll have to try again. So they can try another animal as well. So they'll have to scan again and uh, add the 3D object, and all the letters will be appear there. So the app will then quickly uh, indicate whether the chosen letters for the 
uh, phrase are uh, correct or incorrect. So this gives kids a fun and engaging method to participate uh, in an educational process while assisting them with the visualizing the letters in a way. So let's see the procedure of this AR. Uh, in this project, we have used uh, pre-made 3D animal items and letters of the alphabet. Uh, then imported them into the uh, scene form Android Studio plugin to make adjustments and place them in an uh, augmented reality environment. Uh, to display these AR models using AR code, the process can be summarized as shown in this image. So kids can uh, click on the flashcard surface to access the AR fragment page. So display model technique uh, involves setting up a Firebase database, uh, attaching the 3D model to uh, node uh, in the graph and creating a temporary file to download the model. So then the build model method is used to create a 3D model on the fly and the link to a node in the scene graph. So the procedure of CNN models, the convolutional neural networks are used to recognize 3D letters uh, in AR by preprocessing the data and applying scaling, normalization, and augmentation. So the model takes the preprocessed image as input, uh, processes it through uh, uh, its layers, and predicts the most likely letters as the output. So the CNN model is trained uh, to recognize 3D letters in AR. So uh, there's an RNN part as well, the recurrent neural networks. Uh, those are used to, uh, for tapping on 3D letters for pronunciation as they can effectively model the sequential nature of the language and speech. So this RNN process, a sequence of taps, uh, it's representing uh, different aspects of the tap letters uh, and predicts the letter or words pronunciation uh, using a softmax layer. So after developing the application, uh, it was tested under a set of uh, teachers and parents for take the ideas. So a list of uh, 15 statements uh, on a seven point Likert scale was used for analyze the teachers and parents' perception and intentions uh, to use the application by kids. So here are the top seven statements mentioned here in this table. So the results uh, reveal that the app is useful uh, for teaching and memorization of letters within words as well as the association of words with uh, objects in early childhood. So by using uh, the application which enables them to build words inside a real time interactive environment uh, and obtain a feedback, uh, kids are uh, interested and delighted. So the capabilities of the app uh, complement traditional learning methods and the application uh, has the potential to serve as a useful tool for kids who are developing literacy skills overall. So the development of this uh, AR learning application offers a unique and interactive way for kids to engage with educational content with their advanced linguistic abilities uh, that can be enhanced using uh, speech recognition and natural language processing algorithms. So the use of uh, design patterns and development frameworks uh, streamlines the, uh, and improves the overall development process. So in Sri Lanka, the preschool teachers and parents are satisfied with the application's performance and the user experience. So overall AR applications have the potential to revolutionize the education, uh, providing exciting opportunities uh, for learners of all ages. So here are my references. So I'm very much thankful to all the lecturers in Faculty of Computing, uh, General Sir John Kathar Defense University, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. D. Silva. It's a very interesting uh, presentation on your research. So uh, we thank you again. And uh, please, uh, if you have any questions to the presenter, please uh, make note. We will take everything at the end of the session. So moving on, uh, we'll go to the next uh, presentation, uh, titled Enhancing Crop Quality of Paddy Using Object Detection Techniques. The authors are W.D. and Sandeepani, S. Raknayaka, and A. Guru Singha. So Ms. Sandeepani uh, is a fourth year undergraduate at Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, and her major is uh, data science, and she is passionate about extracting insights from data. She is uh, dedicated to honing her analytical skills with a strong academic foundation and a drive for learning. She is poised to contribute to the field of data science. So over to you, Ms. Sandeep. So I'm Nilakshi Sandeepani on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. 
and uh, my research topic is uh, enhancing the crop quality of paddy using object detection techniques uh, with the paper ID uh, 216. So as we all know, uh, the rice is a staple uh, food for over half of the world's population, especially in Asia. So it is a kind of a significant uh, commodity in international trade as well. So this rice plant or this paddy crop comprises of seven stages in its life cycle. So in my research, I am uh, mainly focusing on the third stage, which is the vegetative phase of the uh, paddy crop. Um, so uh, this uh, vegetative phase uh, allows the paddy crop to develop a robust uh, leaf canopy and uh, it optimizes the photosynthesis and absorbs essential nutrients and it builds stress uh, resistance as well. So why this vegetative phase is more important or why we need to pay our attention to this vegetative phase is because uh, the vegetative phase is the time period where the paddy crops are really vulnerable to diseases. So. Uh, if I mention some of the diseases which the paddy crop uh, is vulnerable during this period, the stunted growth, reduced photosynthesis, increased susceptibility to stress, reduced quality and the increased cost. Therefore, due to those reasons, we have to timely detect the diseases uh, of the paddy crop during this vegetative phase. So uh, the research gap or uh, the difference among uh, the researchers which are done previously with my research is the lack of an interactive real-time monitoring visually appealing responsive web application uh, to detect those diseases and to display them. So then we'll move on to the literary review or the literature review. Uh, the primary objective of this literature review is to establish the theoretical framework and existing knowledge based upon which our research is built on. So uh, I have categorized this uh, literature into several key themes to help structure our discussion. Uh, so let's begin with the first category. So in the first category, the researchers have found the capability the capability of YOLO version 5 uh, model on recognizing the diseases, specifically the powdery mildew disease, uh, which is caused to rubber uh, and the strawberry plants. Uh, another research which was done uh, recently to identify the defects of rice is uh, to identify the rice kernels defect uh, using the multi classification model. Uh, which is the YOLO version 8. So apart from them, uh, as the second theme or the, as the second category, uh, it focuses on the identification of diseases infected to paddy plants using machine learning models. So within this theme, the literature reveals the utilization of fast RCNN, mobile net version 2 and candy algorithms to identify the diseases. So if we move on to the methodology, uh, initially I have gathered around 5,000 images uh, from a paddy field using uh, Osmo mobile uh, device and a smartphone. So this Osmo mobile 3 device contributed to capture the aerial view of the paddy fields in a stabilized manner because uh, inside that device we can find a kind of inbuilt stabilizer therefore we can uh, resist the shakiness while capturing the images uh, so then the captured images uh, uh, belonged to four major categories as healthy plants and the plants which are infected with yellow blight tundra and brown spot disease so then the, all the images were divided into three sections as train, test and valid. So those three sections are defined in the all V8 model itself. Um, then the images were pre-processed uh, using some image augmentation techniques to make the model more general. That means to make the, so we can use the model uh, with several other plants as well. 
So the to pre-process, I have used some augmentation methods such as uh, random rotations, flips, and brightness adjustments as well. Then uh, the pre-processed images were labeled using a third-party application. Uh, the labeled images were inserted as the input for the YOLO V8 model to detect the diseases. Um, then uh, what I did was the trained model was hosted on a server and a custom API is set on the server to build the communication between the model and the web application. So web application contains the backend and the frontend. The backend of the web application was created using uh, Node.js and the frontend using React. Uh, the backend server communicates with the model's API to send the data for inferences. Now uh, let me explain the high level user journey uh, of my application. So the UI of the web application uh, allows the users to interact with the application so that users can upload images, videos or the real time captured data using the uh, front end. So after receiving uh, the input data by the web application, it directly transfers to the YOLO, YOLO V8 model through the custom API, which I mentioned previously. Um, then the model performs, that means the YOLO V8 model performs the necessary processing part and detects the diseases. So the response is transferred again to the backend through the custom API in the form of classification labels and object bounding boxes. The backend sends the response back to the front end to display the results to the user. So the results are displayed in the front end as a logical map. That means the final output would be a logical map. And uh, a, cal a calculation is performed to find the spread of each disease by dividing the count of each disease type by the total count of diseases in the selected plot of land. So in this slide you can see uh, the overall functional diagram which I have mentioned uh, in the previous two slides. So in this slide also uh, you can see the interface of the final web application embedded with the logical map with provided detailed metrics about the spread of diseases. That means uh, our final output would be this one with a logical map divided into plots of lands uh, by considering the rows or the columns. And for a specific plot of land, uh, the diseases with the spread uh, is depicted like this. And um, when capturing the uh, disease data set or when capturing the images, we should keep uh, this thing in mind. So the uh, images should be captured according to a pattern that means in row wise or column wise to obtain this uh, output. So after uh, training the model, these auto generated graphs uh, were received. Uh, in the left hand side you can see the, the distribution of each disease in my data set. And in the right hand side, we can see the de detected diseases in a randomly selected set of images. So uh, in this slide, under analysis and conclusion, I would like to mention that in most of the images, the diseases on the leaf blade are visually imperceptible. That means it is in micro level. Uh, difficult to identify in our naked eye, but in using this YOLO V8 model, uh, we had the capability to distinguish them approximately. And um, this proposed model was able to work fine with multi scaled images as well, so we don't need to worry about a specific size of image. Um, so, in future work, uh, I suppose to use graphical elements like heat maps or colored markers to visually represent the percentage wise spread of each disease in the selected plot of land. So still uh, I have developed that map, logical map. So in the future work uh, I suppose to build these UI features as well. And uh, additionally uh, I wish to allow users to interact with the logical map like zoom in and uh, explore different plots to view the disease percentages. So that's it about my component. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Sandeepani, for your uh, illustrative uh, presentation on your research. So next, uh, let's move on to the last presentation of this session, uh, which is titled uh, Development of a Web Application for Asthmatic Wheeze Detection Using Convolutional Neural Networks. Uh, authors are D.P. Daraniyagala, G.I. Uvantika, M.K.P. Madhushankar, and MTKD Disanayaka. So the presenting author is uh, Ms. Devani Daraniyagala, uh, who is currently a final year undergraduate following the BSc Honors degree in Software Engineering degree program at General Sir John Kotlawala Defense University. Over to you, Ms. Daraniyagala. Good evening, all. So uh, today I am going to present to you my research study, a development of a web application uh, for asthmatic waste detection using convolutional neural networks. So I am DP Daraniyagala, final year software engineering undergraduate at KDU. Um, so this is uh, the main overview of the presentation that I am going to go through. So uh, monitoring health conditions is becoming uh, very popular as the people's quality of life improves. So asthma or wheeze uh, is a persistent respiratory disorder that impairs breathing. When, when you have wheeze, your airway will get blocked and it, you will be having a difficulty in breathing. So uh, continuous and automatic monitoring of such kind of respiratory status is necessary. And uh, according to the studies done, around 4,000 to 5,000 people are dying in each year uh, due to these respiratory disorders. So, uh, and in Sri Lanka also these uh, respiratory disorders uh, plays a significant health issue and uh, currently there is no automated uh, system to detect waste in clinical usage. So my approach is to develop a web application to solve this problem. So this uh, web application receives the audio recording through an electronic stethoscope and passes them onto the machine learning model that I have developed and uh, it analyzes the uh, audio and uh, the outputs are predicted and this uh, system is uh, developed to use in the patient's monitor uh, where the clinical staff can uh, use the system. So this is the main literature review I have done uh, in order to uh, conduct this research. In the uh, final slide, I have uh, added the uh, summary of the research uh, studies that I have done. So there are various technologies used like uh, DSP, IoT, uh, neural networks uh, and all. And uh, they have used various equipments in order to get these audio recordings to the system. And uh, after getting that audio recordings, uh, these systems have used uh, various features like uh, sampling rate, air quality, the wheezing sound, the time frequency uh, to analyze the audio recordings. And also uh, there are various accuracies uh, achieved in these systems uh, according to the technologies used. So uh, as I previously mentioned, my aim is to uh, develop this uh, web application to monitor ways. So this is uh, like the main methodology as I previously mentioned. The audio recording will be taken uh, from the stethoscope to the patient and uh, it will be uh, taken by the web application and uh, using the model. Uh, the out output can be uh, waived by the medical staff using the web application. Uh, so. So this, uh, I have get a data set of audio recordings from cable and uh, those audio recordings were around 10 to 30 seconds. So I have uh, converted those audio recordings to spectrograms and uh, labeled those spectrograms and feed it to the model, to develop the model. And uh, now I am developing the uh, web application using ReactJS and my backend is developed using Python. And as the uh, further steps, I have to uh, integrate the model uh, to the web application. And uh, around 70 to 80% accuracy was uh, achieved from the model. 
this is like the main UI I have developed. Uh, just a simple UI that any uh, medical staff can use uh, quickly. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as my final conclusion, I have developed the model and I have to, uh, and the front end, I have to uh, connect the front end and back end and to the model and uh, give the necessary uh, outputs using the web application. These are the references that I have used. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Darani Agala, for a nice presentation. So we have come to the end of our session. So we can start our Q&A session. Yeah, OK. Uh, so let's uh, do the physical uh, ones first. Uh, so let's consider the paper ID 81 uh, presented by Ms. Uh, Vanyarachi, Mr. Vanyarachi, uh, titled Integrator Model for Identifying the Learning Style of Students Using Machine Learning Techniques and Approach of Felder Silverman Learning Style Model. Yeah, uh, the first question is, uh, which I have, where you have collected this the data set and from where you yeah. have collected this? Yes, sir, uh, data set thought collection is a real-time environment. Uh, that means a course designed for the university. Uh, for a one particular set, uh, nearly 150 students were used, and three courses were designed in the university uh, environment. So is it local? Uh, yeah, local. Lo local. Okay. And uh, can you elaborate why you have selected a Silverman model? If we uh, consider the uh, learning style model, there are many, uh, like Kolb's learning model, Wark, and uh, Honey and Muffet. But uh, go through the literature reviews, the Silver Felderman has covered the eight dimension. If I not selected the Silver Felderman, the next time I'm going to go with Wark. That is the most accepted method. Uh, but uh, Felder Silverman discuss about the eight dimension. That is the reason for uh, selecting eight dimension. OK, Ashim. Uh, uh, did you collect the data from the model? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. How did you collect it? Yeah. For the data collection, I used uh, two methods. That is the uh, Moodle logs. That is actually already available uh, service in the Moodle logs. I can uh, I get the uh, hits uh, how the students are access the course. And uh, for the next one, because uh, my uh, proposed methodology. Uh, discuss about two things, that is the uh, total time spent and the uh, access seats. For the uh, getting the total time uh, students spent, uh, I uh, develop a separate plugin, Moodle time tracking plugin, using both two methods, that is uh, one of my research contribution. So using that, both of the methods, I collect the data. OK, another one, right, that uh, course also be developed by the KU, yeah. Yeah, right, and then uh, they followed the learning styles. Yeah. Right, and based on that one, you are Based on that, uh, I collected the data. Ah, right, and also separately are doing the questionnaire. Yeah. What kind uh, of... Questionnaire means uh, that is already accepted one. Uh, ah. Aligned to the uh, failure Silverman model, they have developed an uh, index learning style question that is uh, considered of 44 questions. Okay. It covers... Uh, from the 44, uh, 11 questions cover uh, one dimension. Okay, that is because, uh, because for the labeling process. First, I happened to uh, went through that and collected the data. All right. Okay. Right. Uh, I think the, uh, this kind of thing, uh, which, which, right, for example, in the instructional design, right, yeah. and uh, these kind of things very useful. Yes. Right. For example, did you participate? They develop the content, or you guide them to develop it? Yeah. No. Actually, I developed the course content. Uh, you developed the course content. I developed content. the course okay. content and we are publishing the Moodle uh -huh. and uh, ask the students to en engage in the course. Uh, right, actually, the, the course that uh, yeah, course. current courses. Current courses. Uh, right, okay. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? I think uh, I'm trying to expand my research with the uh, course design process. In the course design, that is for the, uh, uh, my this research uh, extent on uh, the student side. For the, uh, if we consider instructor or lecturer or a teacher sites, when a teacher is designing a course, we can uh, see how 
the combination of attri attribute can be uh, facilitating that. For an example, if we consider a particular PPT, PowerPoint slide, sometimes the font size of the PowerPoint sign will maybe discourage us. So likewise, we can uh, identify several combination of features for the design of the courses as well. I think uh, it will be my future directions. Okay, if now let's give a big hand to Mr. Tendokon. Uh, next, uh, if there are any questions to Mr. SHID and De Silva, who presented interactive uh, spelling application for preschoolers, a journey towards playful language exploration. Our judges, you may start. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, can you tell me how you apply this AR to this application? Yes, uh, since we have used AR Core, it's a Google supported uh, API, so we can use that API to, uh, to easily integrate with Android Studio uh, with, uh, with the help of Java. Okay, so that means you have used the uh, APIs for the particular application? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, can you tell me what is the what is the task you do with this uh, CNN and RNN? with this application, uh, how is it relevant? Yeah, CNN actually we used uh, it for uh, identify the uh, alphabet, I mean the letters, and the RNN is for, uh, for, uh, for floating and for identifying those, those nodes and when the, uh, when the user uh, taps the letters, uh, so the sequence needs to be identified. For, for that, actually we, we didn't train those uh, uh, models, we got those trained models from uh, uh, deep reports. So my question is like, how do you uh, like uh, help uh, students to improve the pronunciation? So, yeah. Yes, uh, so uh, actually that uh, didn't hear through this presentation because uh, it, uh, this application, it has the Google uh, voice to text uh, integrated with the application. Yeah, so when the yeah, I do understand, but you are dealing with small kids. Yes. Right, so uh, the literacy, the the level of handling the smartphone yeah. will differ. So like you'll say two and a half years uh, kid or oh, and the uh, six years kid, they have a huge gap. Yes. So how do you mitigate that? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, this is focusing only on uh, three to seven year old children. And also uh, definitely this will need the guidance of the parents as well because I'm not, I'm still developing it. So I'm going to, uh, uh, add some uh, guidance or the, like some notes before uh, playing this game uh, or starting this application so the parents can read those notes and they can guide uh, their kids uh, in, a, in an appropriate way. You have focused this for preschoolers, right? Yeah, preschoolers and grade one students. So uh, my suggestion is like, so uh, if you can in, uh, improve this thing to a wearable device, Mm -hmm. kind of uh, glasses or something like that, that would be great and the interactiveness will um, be high than the using mobile phone, right? And um, so what are the other challenges that you faced? Yeah, actually I'll add something to the first point, sir, because right. uh, when, uh, when wearing something like, uh, like a, uh, something to wear, uh, something to those ki those uh, range of age kids, I think it's a little bit of challenge because they are always like uh, not concentrated on anything. They can like easily uh, like remove it or uh, do that kind of things. Uh, but we can see that uh, most of the uh, preschoolers are also uh, using mobile uh, applications, mostly mobile games these days. So I think uh, rather than playing a uh, like a normal uh, fun game, uh, this kind of uh, uh, application which helps to uh, learn something will uh, helpful to them. So that's why I thought of like uh, doing this. And uh, yeah, is that your POV or point of view or yeah. like? Yeah, that's okay. my point of view. So I think you better do uh, research on that as well. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, and uh, have you done uh, research on this? Uh, detailed research because I don't feel you have done enough. So uh, can you tell me, uh, have you researched by giving this application to children, they are, what is their feedback actually? 
so once we done whatever developing application we need to get the feedback right yes, sir. so what is their feedback or oh. whether those children or it could be teachers or it could be parents what their feedback uh, actually i mentioned it in my slide as well so uh, we have uh, meet with uh, uh, 15 or 20 uh, students with uh, i mean preschoolers with uh, parents and we uh, gave them the application and we asked them to like try it out so then the uh, results were positive uh, most of them were satisfied uh, with the applications yeah again my sorry my next question is like so what is the language that you used i mean uh, english or singular uh, english english yes okay because i couldn't find a, a matching uh, 3d models uh, in single alphabet uh, that i do understand yes okay Thanks. so I, I i i suggest that you do more research on this area and uh, yeah sure sir. thank you okay. are there any more questions from the audience Uh, limitations also I have mentioned uh, in my research itself. Uh, uh, one is uh, I have only developed it for uh, Android applications, so still it is not developed for iOS or anything. So the uh, so the uh, it's not very uh, broad yet. Uh, so and other thing was uh, it is only focusing on like three to seven uh, year old children. Those are my limitations. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have one small question of my own. Uh, did you involve any medical experts or some domain experts in your research? Uh, yes, I have interviewed one uh, one uh, uh, lecturer who uh, he's the one who helped to uh, uh, like uh, create the uh, preschoolers uh, curriculum uh, or the syllabus for this uh, Western province. So they have a specific syllabus for uh, in this western province uh, educational uh, department so i have uh, interviewed him as well sir. okay thank you i think thank you sir. should continue with more like uh, when handling kids like more ethical considerations should also uh, those clearances should be taken because sometimes some kids get motion sicknesses and things uh, when using these devices so be careful and get all the clearances in future Sure, sir. thank you. Okay, uh, so let's give a big hand to uh, Mr. Silva. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, next, uh, if there are any questions to Ms. Sandeepani, who presented enhancing crop quality of paddy using object detection techniques. So, Nilakshi, yes. Okay, Nilakshi, so I have uh, so gone through your presentation, well structured, and I have seen the gaps, uh, how to do the methodology, and it's very clear. And uh, I have few questions like um, when it comes to data capturing and all. So I have seen that you have done a great job. So uh, how do you select? How do you um, like uh, define the data set sample size? So sample so size. Um, so uh, what was your approach? Uh, so I collected basically around five thousand. Uh, image data uh, from different different paddy fields in western province so while i was going through the previous literature or the research papers uh, i have identified that those research papers are based on uh, large data sets so in order to train a cnn model we uh, needed to have a big data set therefore i gathered 5000 images yeah so um how do you know that 5,000 images are enough for the research? Uh, actually, while uh, doing the training process, I was able to uh, get an accuracy around 80%, okay. uh, 78 uh, like that. So therefore, uh, in order to improve, so I just, I wish to improve the model. To improve the model, uh, uh, I wish to gather uh, some more images from different, different uh, paddy fields in different brightness levels so and uh, wish to improve the model so still i just used only 5000 okay um, 
for the training purpose, so I have seen that you you identified uh, four types of diseases, right? Four, yeah. Yes. Uh, three diseases. Three and three types. Uh, yes. And for for that, uh, from where did you get the expertise? I mean, like you are not the not related to that yes. area, like uh, not into agriculture, like or something like. That. So from where did did you get the expertise? And uh, did you refer someone, or yeah. uh, did you refer internet, or like? So uh, we contacted. Uh, a plant researcher in CIC agrobusiness farm. So the person was uh, supporting us uh, from the start of our project up to now. Okay, how do you validate those uh, those uh, inputs are the really valid? So after uh, getting the input from him, I just uh, googled it as well. Then I was able to find out that brown spot, tungro, and yellow blight are common diseases for all kinds of paddy fields. Okay, so uh, you, as you said, like you did the aerial view as well. Yeah. What are the inputs and what are the parameters that you use to train the model? Uh, I mean, like, what are the what is the advantage that you got this from this aerial view? Uh, because in order to capture the so most of the diseases are they are on the leaf blade of the paddy plant. Therefore, I uh, just used aerial view to capture the the disease properly. If we uh, capture the diseases from the ground level, it is kind of difficult to identify the disease or the symptoms. That's why I used aerial model. Okay, is that the cost, most cost effective way to get the images? I mean, Cosmo is very expensive. Uh, so I used that Osmo version 3. It's kind of expensive, but still uh, most of the people have their smart mobile phones nowadays. So they can. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just referring. Like, if you go to industrial level, that's okay, right? If you, if you going to enhance this thing up to industrial level, that that doesn't matter. But yes. Yeah. Again, again, 50-50. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that I can understand. Yeah. Um, again, uh, how do you uh, run the model? I mean, like, is it real time? Uh, we have the both the options. That means we can uh, use real-time capturing as well as we can input an image or a video and uh, identify the disease. If it is real-time, what are the challenges that you face? Like, uh, if it is real-time, you need to deal with anyhow, you need to deal with the cloud. Right? Yeah. So what are the challenges? Have you so, tried? Yeah, I have tried, sir. So uh, while I'm uh, using the uh, real-time, so I used webcam. Uh, and uh, some amount of lag lagging was there uh, while uh, identifying the disease. So that was the main uh, difficulty I faced. Okay, what are the services that you used? Where you hosted then? Uh, In I mean, Flask. Yeah, what are the services that you used? What is the cloud uh, provider that you use? So actually I didn't use AWS or Azure. I just used uh, Flask uh, and Node.js to uh, like to build the back-end process uh, to communicate with the API, the front-end was built using React. What is the communication medium that you used like to uh, communicate with the cloud? I mean like... Python. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you faced any limitations when, when uploading like ha big payload like... Uh, the network issue was there from the start. Other than that, uh, couldn't figure out any. So have you noticed like when, when capturing people, what is the, the amount of megabytes that you sent uh, I know I understand it depends on the camera that you are using but yeah. you should have a benchmark what is the minimum uh, the level the minimum uh, what you call like um, the yes resolution yes sorry I forgot that. have you identified that or still Yo, please process. work on that like because you, you know um, you need to um, enhance the system like uh, with the minimum um, uh, what it call like resources you need to improve the system right so this is a very good product and thank you sir. very nice thank, thank you, you sir. Right, uh, so then we have our final Presenter, Mr. D.P. Daraniagala, 
uh, if you have any questions to her for her presentation title development of a web application for asthmatic wheeze detection using convolutional neural networks can you tell me uh, so you have done the research on asthma so the sample data where did you get it i i got a uh, data set from kegel sorry can you speak loud a, i got a data set from kegel and uh, use the audio recordings from that data set is it uh, normally uh, asthma cause due to different kind of uh, environment so is this uh, data set you collected is similar to the countries like ours so any other so european uh, no it could be arabian countries so uh, when we take a person we uh, we see is uh, i guess all same to all the persons it will uh, produce a whistling sound from your uh, uh, res uh, respiratory signals so uh, i guess it's all same to them no all same but i'm i'm asking the environmental condition and because of the environmental condition it could be the data set which ever you took is it from asian data data set to what about the uh, no it's a data set used in america Oh. Yeah, I want to add something on that on top of that. Like, so uh, the whatever the data set that that you took, they you might have, you might need to clean, right? Um, so noises and everything. Like, so how do you how do you handle that? So uh, I have uh, written a code for to clean the audio recordings to remove the noise and also to uh, convert them to uh, spectrograms. And next, I have developed the model and feed up the spectrograms to that to train the model. Okay. So, the, uh, so that data set only only that data set you used on US data set, right? Yes. So, what is the sample size of that? Uh, around 150 audio recordings. 150. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Neuro. What are the reasons for using convolution neural network? Uh, so this is my final year project. So before doing, to, uh, doing the final year project, we had to do a study. In that study, I have uh, analyzed uh, various technologies I have mentioned in the literature review also. So in that study, uh, I have uh, seen with, uh, various technologies used and the accuracies and uh, neural networks provided a better accuracy. Okay, are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, if not. I have one question from myself. Uh, now you are recommending uh, therapeutic uh, things, right? Like medicine or something. So, uh, was a medical expert involved in your team? Yes, uh, I have uh, involved a doctor from South, uh, Columbus South Teaching Hospital. So for was the a validation done with real data? Uh, not yet. Data? I have just created the uh, model. I have to do the validation part. Okay. Thank you. So let's give a big hand to Ms. Darren Yegel. Uh, next, uh, I think uh, we have our online presenters available. So let's, uh, if you have any questions to Mr. Tenakon, who presented deep learning based approach for obstructive sleep apnea detection using EEG signals. So uh, can you explain me uh, any challenges you found in this research? Um, so, um, you said like uh, you are dealing with ECG signals, right? Yeah, yeah so uh, how, how do you like deal with that, like uh, how do you um, get the data?
real real time real time data pass. Okay. Do you have any plan how to like capture in a practical manner? Yeah. Actually, not yet. Uh, I'm only. Uh, 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 developing the model uh, now. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's give a big hand to Mr. Tendakorn also. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Navaratna, who presented a gated recurrent unit neural network based uh, predictive maintenance approach for machinery maintenance in the apparel industry. Sorry, Ms. Navaratna. Right. So, uh, my very first question is, uh, what are the machineries that you used? Are those generic machines? Well, uh, then this data set from the internet. However, I'll check with the Sri Lankan government factories and found, I found that uh, there are some machines that use the same, uh, the same uh, reading, such as the button color machines and as well as uh, some machines related to uh, producing undergarments. Okay, so um, basically whatever the research or the, uh, the product or whatever we develop, right, so we need to um, adapt it to local context. Otherwise, no use of doing a research or the product or whatever. So um, my suggestion is before, before you go into deep, you check whether this is applicable for local context, right? Otherwise, it's useless. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, one more question from my end. Uh, mm, so, um, machine to machine, vendor to vendor, the failure rate will differ, right? So, um, yes. Yeah, how, how, what are the findings that you got so far? Let's say Siemens or the uh, high level manufacturer from Germany, so very reliable uh, machine manufacturers are there. So comparing to other, like let's say, I don't want to like <laughs> degrade anyone, but anyway, let's say China or India. So, so we obviously know that the, the reliability is a bit low, right? So how, how, how do you like uh, get the, uh, what is what is your uh, approach and what are your findings? So can you please repeat the question again? Uh, yeah, I'm just referring. So as you said, uh, the failure rate. You're dealing with the failure yes, rate, sir. no? So uh, dip it depends on the vendor, uh, let's say Siemens or whoever, so German vendors, so we know highly reputed reliable vendors are there, but uh, when it comes to Chinese machines, machineries, Indian, or the, the failure rate will low, right? The, the, not the failure rate, the, the reliability is low, right? So yes. how do you, um, how do you uh, recognize those things? What is your approach, like when it comes to this, this context? So you are basically dealing with failures now? Yes, basically. Yes, so that is right, yes. You got my, uh, my question? Hello? Yeah, you got my question or not? So it's, it's not very much clear. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it again, right? So how do you refer, like, uh, behavior of, uh, like, uh, machine to machine, right? the failure rates. So this data set uh, had some hundred machines, so they have the uh, component that is recorded with them. Those data sets and from data similar data machines, is it? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, clear. Similar machines, similar vendor, right? Same vendor? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. that's then clear. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, uh, thank you everyone. So uh, let's give a big hand to uh, Ms. Navaratna also. So let's hope she can uh, make a model for our Sri Lankan machines also in future. 
So it's, a, it's, it's been a very interesting session on the innovative applications of AI and machine learning in education, healthcare, and industry. So we had a mix of all uh, three here. So I hope you enjoyed the session. And let's give a big hand to all our presenters again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the end of the computing technical session three. It's time to sum up the session. Now I would like to invite the chair of the session, Dr. S. R. Lienage, to present certificates to the presenting authors. Mr. W. A. A. M. Waniarachi. Mr. S. H. I. D. N. De Silva. Ms. W. D. N. Sandeepani. Ms. D. P. Baranyagara. Now I would like to invite Rector, Metropolitan Campus, Major General A. L. D. M. Gunasekara, RSP, USP, PLC, accompanied by Dr. Asila Gunasekara, Dean, Faculty of Computing, to present a token of appreciation to the chairperson. Thank you. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend our gratitude to Dr. S. R. Lienage for chairing the Computing Technical Session 3. And with this, we conclude this session.